Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast, where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature. This is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world, some of the most amazing movement thinkers, and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory, strength and conditioning, and everything in between. So if you're interested in movement, please stick around. And if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hello, and welcome back to the Evolve Move Play podcast. My guest this week is Yosef Frusik from Fighting Monkey. Yosef is, of course, very well known in the movement community, and his work with Fighting Monkey is terrific. It's very diverse. It's extremely interesting. It's very um, sophisticated. It has tons of interesting variations and layers that have been developed into it. This is my second conversation with Yosef, and I always enjoy these second chances to th- uh, talk to a thinker because we get to dive deeper after having established the grounds. If you're not familiar with Fighting Monkey, go ahead and watch that first interview. But this next interview, it, it allows us to go deeper into some really interesting spaces around how we organize our practice and to get some really unique insights from Yosef about where his practice comes from, what the stories are that motivate him, and, and how he he looks at, at, at the process of of building something through movement practice. So I, I think this is, uh, again, an extremely interesting and really engaging podcast. And I'm, I'm very excited to hear how people respond to it. So without further ado, Yosef Rusik. Yosef, welcome back on the Evolve Move Play podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to be back. <laughs> so actually, what I wanted to start with today was um, the origin of the Fighting Monkey name. I don't think we got into this, but it's uh, but I think there's quite an interesting meaning behind it, and it's not necessarily obvious to people at first glance. Mm-hmm. Thank you for asking this. Uh, you know, the monkey is is very interesting animal. You know, it's it's a leader. It's super intelligent. It's uh, empathic. Has a lot of great collaborative skills, and throughout the um, many. Asian stories, this animal appears. And it's, of course, it's our, it's our direct lineage. And, you know, this beautiful, intelligent animal and that kind of going back to the roots, you know, this other name that we have also, Rootless Root, Mm -hmm. somehow inspired me to, and Linda, to give it that name. And that fighting monkey, of course, is that other side of that monkey is the monkey that is our mind that is always talking, constantly talking, disturbing us, uh, taking us away from the kind of essentials. So you're f- fighting the monkey mind. <laughs> yes. So um, the audience is probably somewhat familiar with the idea of the monkey mind, but that's that's a fairly specific idea, is it not, to like Asian traditions of meditation? You know that you, you already know me quite well, and and you know that I, I I do not necessarily connect with these usual terms like meditation because I really do not know what they mean. Uh, you know, if the, the part of our search for so many years was what's before those names that became so established in our culture, and uh, we became so smart about about these names. So, you know, I, I was always thinking. What was before the so-called meditation? Um, and you know, it's a, a hunt, meditation is like a hunting movement. When you know, I, you know well that I'm coming from a hunting family, and always when we went with my father to woods, to mountains, to observe the animals, to observe the nature, uh, there's this process of taking the journey to get there, then being there, waiting for a really long time to see animal because it's not that easy to see wild animal because they smell you they they know you are there they are very much aware of your presence so that that waiting that understanding of the landscape uh, clouds moving the wind moving in certain directions uh, uh, the weather condition the uh, our understanding where the animals might be when they where they rest where they go to eat etc 
that's where we suddenly have to become a little bit more quiet. We have to little become be, become a little bit more observative of the landscape that we are part of, rather than being so much observe ob, observing only ourselves. And and it seems like meditation has become this kind of self cultivation, and 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 it's similar to the self cultivation is similar to a homeostatic idea homeostasis right that you find a balance within your own, own self within your own organism but you know much better idea it's allostatic balance allos as someone else allostatic means that you can stay in balance only in a good communication with the environment that you are part of and so this hunting movement this what we call now meditation is a quality of observation quality of being quiet in order to be able to see something that was before invisible and that would be very much also present in what is now happening in modern physics right that we are not studying objective universe but because we participating in that observation we are altering the events and we are bringing into existence certain things. We are altering what we are seeing, right? So for me, the meditation means nothing. But going for a journey with my friends, with other hunters, and trying to see how the nature is, that would be something for me, like a the basic explanation of what meditation could be, even in a modern age. <laughs> Alistair, so that's one of the themes that I'm interested in talking to you about is this idea that, uh, so what I'm hearing from you is sort of a, uh, a uh, you're pushing back on meditation as being too internally focused today and not, not engaging in um, informing our relationship with the world outside of us and our ability to relate to things. Is that correct? I, I'm not. I, I'm not commenting on anyone or anything. I, I just have the feeling that um, the words degraded, right? We, we as humans, has a great capacity to great degrade a great value of certain words, and so in order to keep them fresh and not step into the automated pilot of thinking and behavioral path patterns and and talks that we have together, our our necessary role is to refresh them for a little while and then go back again what was staying before um I, I i find the value a great value to look at only at yourself so we you close your eyes and you are in some kind of cell right you are in in a monastery or you are in your home it has also its value so i don't want to i don't want to say this is better than something else i just i just like to bring again back the discussion where these words are coming from that that would be more my role in in, in our research and in our practice, rather than commenting on other people or, or on other practices. I I feeling that I rather embrace everyone because I think everyone has something very valuable to add to the pot of human creativity. Sure. So perhaps to rephrase it, you're interested in seeing meditation through another lens and the idea that it, that it exists first as this place to cultivate uh, the quiet of mind and the attention that allows you to, for instance, engage in hunting. Yes, yes. It is necessary for our survival, it was necessary that we are mapping the environment, we are mapping the greater landscape, and further we can see more energetical resources we can have. Many people would ask why it's so difficult to learn at the beginning from fighting monkey. Why is it so puzzled? Why is it so unclear? seemingly unclear why why did why the learning curve is so steep at the beginning why we do not explain things um more step by step in evolution um but you know i feel what is necessary is that we we building up we building up a certain independency uh we 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 go on a journey together but we might see also different things it is not only me who is gonna centralize all that knowledge and pass it to someone else in a kind of given, settled, very structured form. Yeah, so this, this uh, I was listening to my friend Chandler Stevens' interview with you. I thought it was a very interesting interview on the Ecosomatics podcast. And one of the things he pointed out was mm -hmm. that one of your core orientations is towards relationships and communication. Yes. And so you're, yes. you're, you're, uh, you're trying, it sounds to me like you're trying to kind of build an ecology of practices and 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 practitioners, a community that has uh, a capacity for self-organization, right? It gives them everything. 
you know what we are what we are doing is that we we pose quite complex uh, problems in our research or challenges, and um, and every student has their role in contributing to solving the trouble. That means that from very first moment there is a great diversity in the way we are solving the troubles because everyone has very different background in how they structure their learning or how they structure their problem solving or how they structure their language and so there is in very first moment there is a great diversity in the language in the approach so and because that that system is decentralized Therefore, there is a there is a great richness and great responsibility of every person that participates to kind of solve it, and they are also forced to look and look at other workshops and look at other practitioners and see how they've been dealing with the, the with the propositions we gave them. So we might have a workshop that calls anatomy of injury, but anatomy of injury in Dallas, anatomy of injury in Berlin, anatomy of injury in Hong Kong and anatomy of injury in Sydney has very different structure and composition. And those people, they know each other from those different places in the world. They, they sometimes call each other and they ask what we've been teaching them because they know it's going to be different. The thematic is the same, but we are always approaching it from a different angle. Similarly to when you are in, a, in, the, in, the, in the gallery and you're looking at the sculpture, the sculpture reveals something from one angle, but reveals something completely different when you look at it from different angle or in a different cultural context. Yeah. So your 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 goal is to give people different lenses and force them to engage in communication to organize something. Is that correct? Well, you know, I, I would like that they. Uh, we can we can organize the information in many different ways, but let's say we 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 given we now use an analogy of energy, the fossil fuels, right? Or energy they are we are prevalently using. Fossil fuels are very much available, right? They are available immediately. There is a great structure on how to how to take them out, how to process them, how to get them into your machines or whatever that we are using every day. So everything is available. This is one way of doing it. But let's say that, that fossil fuel also creates a lot of damage, right? There is a lot of toxins coming from that immediate availability, like when you eat too much sugar. So what we are searching in, in very initial state of learning is, okay, can you invest in building up, um, let's say, wind energy? Now, wind energy requires a lot of initial uh, investment because you need to understand not only the uh, the technology itself of a windmill, but you need to understand also the entire landscape. You need to understand which landscape do I occupy and in which places the wind has great passage and what is the strength of that wind. And so how do I attune the turbine that is going to be taking the air because if I attune it to high winds, but most of the year I have low winds, then the turbines will be not turning. And if I attune them to low winds, but I have most of the year I have a really high speed of wind, they will break the turbine. So it requires a lot of search before we start to build something. But once it is built, it is running almost forever with very little uh, maintenance necessary. And it is kind of what we now call popularly like a green energy, something that has a smaller impact on the environment in which we live. And this is for me very important that at the beginning of the learning process, we are learning how to invest in ourselves for a long run development. Then of course, to, we need, we need, it's very difficult to come or train yourself in a way to think, okay, I practice my hips my knees or my health of my organs on a run of 10 years or a run of 20 years because structures they change very slowly but we are tending to put everything into a into a pocket of 12 weeks let's say three months where people need to see the results but how you how are you going to put nutrition into your knee capsule it's very difficult some people they say it's almost impossible i say it is possible but it takes a really long time. Are you able to invest in that slow process of rejuvenating your, your joints? That, that's a question. It's because it's complicated at the beginning. But it is extremely rewarding. And anyone can do it, even if you're healthy, even if you're sick, even if you are having already trouble or you have kind of post-trauma um, situation, you are able to invest in a healing of your system. 
that would be around better on the long run. Yeah, I've been posting about this recently. So from so 27 to 30, I suffered uh, a high ankle sprain, torn Achilles tendon, um, subluxated a uh, cuboid bone in my foot, tore ligaments in both my feet, had two back spasms, um, and uh, had a couple re-injuries of a shoulder ro- a rotator cuff injury that I had suffered in my late teens. Mm-hmm. And I was competing in parkour at the time. And I, I was sort of, I was, uh, I thought uh, I was struggling with this idea that I wanted to be competitive and I wanted to win these competitions or at least place well. And I, I sort of had this realization that I could, I could have a two or three year long parkour career where I was constantly in pain and I had to, um, had to just tape myself together and work with, uh, you know, rehab specialists all the time just to stay, you know, in the sport or I could just take that or I could slow my process down and invest my time in building the joint capacity that would allow me to pursue this for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, culture is extremely amazing power over human beings, right? Mm -hmm. Culture can create um, goals and desires that are actually not that beneficial for us. Culture and um, social forces, they bring borders, you know, they create borders like political borders, like we create a border between one joint and another joint. And Mm -hmm. someone would be healing when you have a problem in your wrist, someone would be healing your wrists uh, with the wrist or someone would have a problem with the elbow. So let's do a range of the motion in the elbow. But but nature doesn't have a border. They, they seem to be borders only when you are looking at a very small landscape. When you are, maybe you are in a valley somewhere where it's constantly cloudy because it's the clouds are being kind of embraced by the mountains. But when you zoom out with the with the with the with the with the satellite, you suddenly see that the weather system all around the planet is a one greatly interconnected system, right? And so we we just we we society has the this capacity to create for us a borders and we take them for granted like there is no border between canada and united states neither there is a border between united states and mexico or and other states but we have created these artificial borders and that somehow that type of thinking also then infiltrates into our biology into our behavior into our movement into our healing practices we always create the borders and when you create a border then you need to create a passage from one border to another like we create a border between mind and the body or we create a border between one joint and another and if you create a border then you can create an amazing system amazing method that people will um, learn and they will pay great amount of money for it, right? Instead of understanding that everything is perfectly well interconnected, the only what we need to change is the relation. There was there was no really an there was no really a problem in your body. Your body in, when you were competing in the parkour, your body was was great. The only question was if the relations you created were right, mm-hmm. right? So how much of uh, how, okay, were you able to listening to yourself while you were wanted while, while you wanted to compete? And then how much that would be? But the society might tell you, oh, you need to be first. If you're not first, you're not valued for us. For us. But I benefit much more from having elderly Rafe Kelly telling me his experiences from his life. I I want from Rafe to be longer with me because the longer he is and the longer he's physically active, more valuable informations I will have. So I want you to preserve yourself and still be on the edge, still be doing the most exciting things in the world. But with the fact that you're going to be elderly man holding the hands of your kids, being well-dressed and having some nice meal with me and talking to me about your life experience that's probably for me the most valuable information because then we can put the humanity humanity a little bit further i want your long life experience yeah i had this idea that you, know, you can measure the you could measure a a career in movement or a you know a, a practice in movement by the height it attains um, but you could also measure it by the like the sustained excellence that it can sustain, uh, can sustain, right? So if you can be, yes, I, you know, ten out of ten today, but two years from now you never get to try to do the sport again, is it worth it? Mm-hmm. Or if you can, if you can be eight out of ten today and eight out of ten when you're forty, and seven out of ten mm-hmm. when you're fifty, right? Mm-hmm. Six and a half out of ten mm-hmm. when you're sixty, and at seventy still moving really well. Um, mm-hmm. 
or or you have a different idea or because this is basically and we've been talking about it already before and that's so interesting you can live the time of heroes so you can live the time of iliad of homer you put your body in action and you die in action so you say i i do that sport and i die with that sport my body has no meaning only my glory has the meaning that's also okay yeah. We need to give the variability. We need to give a space for everyone. It is only if you want it or someone else wants it for you. If you are, this is your decision or you've been just manipulated into something like that. I met I a met good amount of athletes that told me very specifically, I care no, I care little about my body. I care about the glory of that sport and me in it. And I say, great amazing so what we can do now together to let you to make you go through it with a minimum possible damage yeah. now that I, I i now that i work with a rather famous uh, now just now retired nhl player and davis cup winner with over thousand matches uh, being played in the united states we were discussing a lot if he could be lasting longer than expected right and and we realized yes he could if he would be more intelligently lead it or someone would help him more intelligently to go through physical preparation but unfortunately our strength and conditioning is so so much still in the level of middle age and um, we are approaching most of the things only through strength rather than through better organization of Freedom, coordination, perception, um, quality of softness, building up, building up our strength through training that will create a self-arranging, self-dynamic system. Cool. Um, yes, let's 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 build that system. That's what I think we're doing. So, but I wanted to that actually loops me back to something that I want to touch on, which was um, you articulated the idea that there's not borders between things. And uh, I think that's true on one level, but I also think it's true to recognize that there are borders between things on the other level, because um, I, I ran into this idea recently, and I think this is, this is actually right at the, at the core of this idea of uh, how we create systems that self-organize and that grow. You have mm -hmm. to have this, um, this op opposition between different, different qualities that are being focused on. So mm -hmm. in, a, uh, in what defines complex systems is that they engage in both greater um, segregation and greater unification, right? So mm -hmm. you start out as a, as a zygote, right? A single cell. And a cell has mm -hmm. a border. It has a, um, oh, I can't remember the name, but it has a, it has a something that mm -hmm. separates it from the rest of the universe. Now that cell multiplies. And as that cell multiplies, mm -hmm. right, it's becoming, it's, it's developing borders around all these things, but then mm -hmm. those borders are being coordinated. There's communication across those mm -hmm. borders and we're developing mm -hmm. systems, right? So you have an organ mm -hmm. system, skin system, the musculoskeletal system, and all those things have, have specialized and become very specific and very uh, tightly contained on one level, but also unified mm -hmm. through synergies on another level. And that's how a complex mm -hmm. organism comes into being. And in the same way, I think that part of what we do in our practice is this tension between, um, you know, we want to create tensions that create self-organization. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize Correct, that? But Go ahead. Yes, yes, you, you, you're very correct. But those borders are penetrable. They, they, they are life, right? And they, they, they. You know, it's, it's not a sealed border, but it's a border that is breathing. That, that is a kind of, uh, you know, that kind of thinking got us a little bit in trouble, right? Because many people, as, as I told you last time, we've been having this friendly talk, you know, I, I see many people being extremely educated and uh, they know so many things about so many things, but then, and, and you mentioned it very beautifully, you know, and then, then when they, when they put themselves in action, it just does not relate at all, you know, like, uh, and, and I know you told me that some people can have, they don't have to practice it, what they know, etc. But I still believe our language was born out of manipulative spatial awareness from articulation of the world, from our embodiment, from our engagement with the world, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, for me, it's, for me, it's still important 
besides all this, our analysis on how complex system works, I still want to see you moving and I still want to see you communicating. And I want to see how that complex system works within the greater complex systems, right? Mm -hmm. This is what I'm interested in because we can get locked in a greatest theories and great, great books, but they really do not mean anything unless they become alive in our daily practice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, this is something that I've been having this ongoing conversation with John Verveke about, and uh, there's a few different elements to this, and I've heard it before, but but he breaks uh, knowledge down into f to four sort of modes of knowledge. One is uh, yes, yes, you said that yes, propositional. The other oh. is procedural, right? So propositional is um, in order to hit a, a baseball, you're going to do X, Y, and Z. Procedural is mm -hmm. I I've done that in my body. Perspectivalism. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like to be there and have the 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 picture there, and I, right. And participatory is mm -hmm. you know, the entire engagement with that that experience, having the crowd there, having everything. So, um, one of the the points that that he makes is that we as a culture, and this is what I think you're calling out, we've fallen in love with the propositional, and we've mistaken the propositional for the reality. It's um, mm -hmm. there's a need, you know very old analogy of this: the map versus the territory. The map is never the territory, and we can we yes. can get addicted to consuming maps and thinking that we know things yes. rather yes. than engaging in exploration of the territory. And mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a very nice analogy for what uh, what you guys do is you you like to to um, define a territory uh, and and get people to explore within it. We, we just like to see if you talk about it, we would like to see how it manifests itself in a, in a physical environment. You know, you can study quantum physics, but can you please show me <laughs> in the space? I, I, and I'm, I know I'm pulling it to the extreme, but can you show me, please, how the wave function collapses into one single position? Can you please explain me that in communication, would you find an analogy in communication training when we work with the voice, when we work in the, with the words, when we communicate to a group of people, um, when, we, when we try to kind of organize the, organize the group to, uh, to create a play or to create a, to create a sculpture or engage whatever creative activity. You know, and, and, you know, like how, when you start to define things, how everything collapses and when you leave it open of how many variabilities are coming in and when it's necessary to close it because you have a moment of premiere or moment when your gallery exhibition will be open or a moment of a match when audience will be seeing you, how you perform in your soccer match or NFL or rugby or whatever sport that would be. So we, we like to play, we like to put really radical questions in, in in testing certain ideas and how they how they actually are manifested in our communication our practice so how do you select the ideas and then how do you select the like <laughs> Mm -hmm. Selection doesn't ever happen uh, through us. I mean, of course, it's, there's a certain amount of selection that is through our personal interest. It's me, Linda, and our closest uh, students, collaborators. But also, um, and mainly, it is when the challenge arises, right? So um, we meet a new, new, we come into a new environment, and then someone tells us in that environment that, guys, we need to solve this particular trouble. We having a huge issues with performing under pressure. And we've tried, we have tried psychology, we have tried uh, mental coaching, but when it came to this critical situation, we still did not perform as we liked. And we said, okay, could we, could we do, can we, could we create games within which we could kind of have a look on these behavioral patterns? And then we would be trying to speculate around it, right? In very creative, very artistic way. So that would be the propositions. The propositions, they do not come out of nowhere. It's not like I sit in the room and I suddenly, oh, this would be a nice challenge to solve. I'm not, that would, we are not driven by that. We are rather driven by some real person is coming and that real person kind of, or real group of people are coming and they are coming with certain challenge. Or someone says to you, well, what's going on with that speed tool? Or what's going on with that ball on the string? And how, or someone might even, um, offend you or someone might even attack you by what you do and these are the most valuable meetings that you can have in your life because the diverse ideas are not only that diverse but the uh, um, those in opposition to you 
are helping you to understand what is it what is it that actually you are doing you are not looking for confirmation of what you are doing you rather look for people or rather wish to meet people that are putting you an obstacle or asking you really radical questions about the practice that you're developing which is extremely painful process because of course you build up something is your baby and someone says to your baby well i think it doesn't work or this works only in very limited uh, number of cases. And you say, oh my God, okay, so let's have a look on it. And then maybe it's time to time, you need to take the bottom brick from what you have created and the whole wall collapses that, you have, what, that you've been building up. And that's just very wonderful, that's amazing. But in order to do that, you need to have an, a great energetical surplus because if you're in energetical crisis, you do not want that anyone affect your main beliefs because your world will collapse. But when you have energetical surplus, someone can throw a wall down or someone can affect the structure. There's a new neural structure that you have built up and you have enough of power through neuroplasticity to kind of rebuild the texture of your brain again. You have a energy to repeat a certain new pattern so they become like a collateral connections or completely a new pathway through which your neuromuscular system will communicate, etc. So it sounds like you're, you're you're proposing an idea of of growth through um, some kind of crisis, right? Some sort of regular exposure to uh, to to something that forces you to rearticulate, that forces you to reimagine. Um, yes, what you do. The, the best thing always happened. The, the best thing. This this is the, this when I remember my life back. I, I remember those moments as being the most nourishing. They, but we have to be also very careful. If we have too much of a negative, like kids, you know, they have to be challenged. But if they're challenged too much, we can block them. We can have, they can be abused, right? And then the development is not possible. So you, as an, as an adult, being exposed to the larger world, you also need to sometimes be careful of how much of stress or how much of risk or how much of... It has to... You cannot be... You have to calculate the risk. If someone tells to me now in my age, well, you can jump like a parkour guy from... A meters down on the ground i will tell you yes it is possible it's a great risk but i am not ready for it i'm not going to take that risk i need to prepare myself right so not stupidly not immediately not because i think that our the practice is really diverse that i can do everything society would for example tell you running is good but it's not good for everyone if you didn't run for all your life and you are in certain age and your vessels where the blood is passing through are not able to expand and, and become smaller, then you might be harming your heart and harming your veins or harming your joints because your coordination is poor in running. So one thing is that what society tells you what is the right thing to do. And another thing is your true understanding, if you're true listening to yourself on how what what would suit to that constitution or that momentarily state that you are in and would allow you to expand in certain area or expand in, in certain intensities, right? There, one of the things that I think is interesting, you know, in, in our conversation is I think that I place a stronger emphasis on articulation, on, you know, like, know your why. Know your why, know what you're aimed at. And I think you place a stronger emphasis on, on, on mystery, on, you know, yeah. stuff that you don't know. Stop I don't know. I, I really don't know. You know, like people say, why? I, I really don't know. I cannot answer. Because the answer would be every day different. And for some people, it might be an, an, an unclarity in direction. And for me, it is what you gain through logical and um, clearly defined pathway and what you gain through intuitive and less structured pathway. And they both have a certain value. And we are, we are different beings and we are, we have, we are different bag of chemicals, right? So <laughs> we incline always to one or another or multiple. And, and for example, I, I enjoy very much uh, hearing you and seeing how you articulate things. And I say, look how beautifully he can articulate the things. He's so well articulated. He's so, he's so, he, he just puts so much thoughts in the way he present the words, this rave. And I said to myself, okay, can, can that be also for me an inspiring element that would lead me to explore more also in my own practice, right? So um, I know I will never be that 
that you, but I will be influenced because this, this membrane of that cell is open. And yeah. so my immunity is rising. And, and I also do not have to feel, I do not have to feel, oh, I don't know as much as he does. So then he makes you feel inferior. But you know, like we cannot know also everything in our life, right? Mm -hmm. So I enjoy the mystery. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy unknown very much. People do not know me maybe, but I was always navigating between sports and arts. And what is beautiful about the sports is that you see if it works. So if I throw the basketball ball into a basket, I know it went in or it didn't went in. It counted as a point or it didn't. I know that the whole game is lasting 40 minutes. Great. But when I have a creative work when i truly engage in a creative work when i sculpt a stone or when i when i work with the wooden beams or when i work with another human beings to create a place so we write a play script we have no idea where we are going and there is no way for us to know it is only an end of the process when we suddenly kind of can trace that evolution and it seems like we all knew at the beginning where we are going but in fact when we are in the middle of it we were all horribly lost right mm -hmm. and that horribly lost this this constant failing allows you to enter areas that you never thought you have always when i finish creative process i think that's it i cannot create anything else i cannot come up with new ideas i'm exhausted and each time you come to a new creative task again something new a new connection you can you can create because you know what is creativity creativity is unexpected connections in our neural networks and there are so many possible there's like endless amount of these new connections that are possible but we kind of slowly encircle ourselves in what we know and i'm so much in so much interested in those things that are not allowing me to kind of circle in myself and be, becoming more and more refined about what i'm doing on the other hand if i may continue yeah i rewrite certain texts over and over again so when it comes to like a uh when it would be something about voice communication, about development of the joints and movement and rhythm, you would see me like, you would see me writing every day. I write and I rewrite the same sentences over and over again. I do this kind of cleaning process when I try to understand what is it that it, that it fascinates me about the joints, right? Because I believe through joints, we can truly see the age. We can truly see our thinking. We can truly see how we behave, right? I can, I can sense through the motion of your joints how your heart is functioning or how your liver is functioning. Everything, the joint has something incredible in itself because it, it is kind of physical representation of these both qualities that you were talking about, you know, the, the border and then also this openness. So joint is like an open connection, but it's the crazy connection of two words. So it is open or it is connected. And then... Every joint, joint in your body has a different composition of openness and closeness. And so my role in it is, okay, so if my joints on the legs are more massive and more stable, I need to give them quality of the mo mobility and lightness of the joints from my hands. And the mobility of the, and the stability of the joints of my legs, I try to put in my arms so they are more stable when I'm striking or when I'm throwing or when I'm doing some uh, more, more violent or not violent, more energetic uh, work with my upper body. So this is this internal alchemy that was going on and been explored through thousands of years through many different traditional cultures. Yeah, if we go back to that model of of uh, of of these oppositional things, right? We need the border and yes. the and we need the connection. So if you think about the joint, right? We like um you know, we do a lot of, of exercises isolating and trying to get better function in this joint. And I think this is a, this is a wonderful practice. Um, but, you know, you guys do a, a beautiful demonstration of how vulnerable any single joint is if it is not in communication with every other joint, right? Isolating, isolating joints and looking at one joint and then looking at another joint, this is like probably one of the biggest flaws we have created in a human human thinking right um 
you know, joints can work good only in collaboration with other joints. I, 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 I lately I was giving lectures somewhere and people are asking me, so yes, so, so there is someone sick and I don't know if people will see me and, uh, you know, like there is someone who is like moving like this, he can and moves, make small steps. It's an old or has uh, hurt joints. And uh, the thing, the person would say, okay, you need a bigger range of motion because your body is all blocked. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm saying like, no, that person doesn't need any bigger landscape to be entering into. He needs to, that person first needs to understand what he or she has in that limitation. So first, it's not opening more. First is to understand better the rhythmicality of what I have. Can I attune better my organism with what is available at this particular moment in this age, in my physical and mental and social, um, social, whatever, social way, right? So I need to understand what is available for me at this point. I can harmonize that little that I have. And then my body will ask by itself to expand more in the larger landscape and so expand more my joints and create a bigger motions, but only as big as it is still interconnected with the rest of the universe. Because if you isolate it, yes, you create a bigger motion, but how in the world, the bigger motion that you gain so fast, do how the tissues around, what is the intelligence of the tissues around, or around that bigger motion? The joint is, we need to respect a little bit more the joints and try to understand why there is a limitation in the joints. What I have been doing in my practice that I have limitation in the joints because there should not be limitation. Now, uh, um, we do we do a training. We finish the training, we are all stiff. So what do we do? We do stretching or we do some kind of range. We kind of articulate our joints. No. Train next time better. So when you finish your practice, your body is still open. Why you always have to create a supplement for your training? Why we always supplement something with something? So you destroy your body with the movement, move better to make it better. Don't create another system that would supply, supplement something, and you will be doing the same mistakes as before in your primal practice. That's what, yeah. I just wanted to repeat back to you a couple of things because I think that, that that's a big takeaway for, for the audience, a really important idea. One is um, if you if you have a limitation in your movement and your and your your joints are not functioning properly, you, what you're adding, or you're thinking, right? Therefore, for you, it doesn't matter. It's not only related to yeah, but go ahead. Um, the first thing is not to expand the range of motion. Uh, the first no. thing is to increase the coordination and rhythmicality um, and uh, integration of the system so that it can move with greater harmony. And then, yes. then things will open up. Yes. By themselves. Why do we always need to dominate the body? Everyone knows something about the body. If we would not so, if we would know so well the body, then there, we would not have any disease in the world, right? If we would know so well, but we need to understand that the human body is not a machine. If we, what is the primal function of the machine? The primal function of the machine is to dump vibration. Because imagine that your car is amplifying vibration. Well, then the wheels, wheels will go away. The doors will be wiggled, etc. Human body do not want to, does not want to dump vibration. It's not a machine. It's not made out of, out of different parts that could be replaced. We are more likely to be like an instrument. Because if I talk to you, my voice resonates through empty cavities. I I am amplifying the vibration of my vocals, right? And therefore you can hear me. Now, the another very important element is that when we design a machine, we know for what purpose and for how long. How do we know what's the purpose of a human being? What is the one direction of it? We have no idea. From the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, what my human body is, is one mystery. It's a poetry. But we hate to read the poetry. And you know why we hate hate to read the poetry? Because we do not understand, because it requires to read it over and over again. Because each time you grow and you become older, each time something changes in your life, that poetry will change. The understanding of what's written in between the words. And I think like we, we are just dominators. We dominate, dominate or because of our knowing, because we are so ignorant. And if we would be less ignorant, we would be probably somewhere else in our, in our relation, in our communications. Imagine, uh, 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 ask, because I can so, go on. Oh. <laughs> no, no, this is wonderful. I really am enjoying this part. Um, 
uh, you brought up this idea that that human beings are not machines, and this is something that that's become very kind of important to me. And um, what I, I'm the more I look at it, the more I see that a lot of the, the the stuff that doesn't seem to work. Right? I look at people and they move and they move poorly, and you go, why do they move poorly? And you dig into it and you see that their 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 training protocol is actually based on the idea of treating the body as a machine, right? It's based on, yep. on a mechanical industrial approach. Let's break it down into pieces, yes. let's isolate the pieces, yes. build the pieces up, and then we'll have this machine of movement. And, and sometimes skills can be developed like this, but fluidity and rhythm and control and adaptability are never developed like that. And when we understand, you know, um, emergent systems, dynamic systems, what we understand is that, uh, is that, that they, they exist in these tensions between things and they exist in this, this, this abundance of degrees of freedom that allows the system to be adaptive. And that's what makes a human being, a living organism powerful. And a human being in some sense is one of the most, is perhaps the most free organism that's ever been developed, right? We have more potentials. Yes. Yeah, um, you know, and I, of of course, you know, like as I said that the human body is not a machine. I I I I like to meet people that mean something in in different fields, and so I very often meet also philosophers. And, and one friend of mine is known philosopher, and and we've been discussing this, and we've been writing something together that will probably no one will ever read and see because that's what we do. But um. What we said at the end of the whole long, really long discussions over weeks and weeks, months maybe, we said, you be whatever you imagine. If you imagine and you want to be a machine, you will be a machine. If you believe that virtual reality is the way you will be training in the future, that's what it will be. If you believe that you will live 120 years, that's what will happen. So at the end, it is really up to anyone to make a choice of what they want to do with their lives. and. And it's up to anyone, if someone proposes something crazy, it's up to everyone to make the decision and make a critical thinking about what was proposed. The, the little bit what challenge is now is that very few people have an idea of, or no, very many people have a really great idea of what critical thinking is. But it sometimes seems that when something is um, proposed with a great um, uh, power, we, we tend to forget about how we could be critically thinking about something. Critical mean, doesn't mean negative, but really questioning a kind of essential questions, right? Mm -hmm. About how the practice is being proposed or what is being proposed for me. Yeah, I mean, so an example of critical thinking is, you know, when I attend your workshops, which I love and highly recommend, um, what I like to do is write down all the drills and then ask myself, um, what is it that I'm receiving from this drill? And what am I doing in my own practice that's parallel to that? And then do I need to adopt this thing? Or do I need to adjust my training a little bit here to achieve the same effect? Right? Or 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 is it already completely congruent and I and I I don't need to adopt the new tool because I have the tool? Right? It's just making sure that you're asking the questions and 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 trying to to steer yourself. But and this is where, where we always go back to mystery versus articulation, because in order to have a thing to steer, you have to have a, a, a schema that tells you where you're going. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but the schema is always incomplete because you also have, you will misguide yourself if you only pay attention to what is articulated. You have to have also the feeling. I, I would like to describe it with the, with the way we are now uh, writing in, in our research is it, it, this analogy goes like this this is what i've seen many times when I, when i was playing in a national theater as an actor when i was younger um, so if people do not know I, I really thought acting is much easier than doing sports i thought this is just meeting beautiful women and just doing pretending that you can do something is much easier than really actually doing it <laughs> certain point of my life i said acting is my career and and i, and I still until now really enjoy that what happened there and everything and uh, but i wanted to say that 
when I was in a theater, when I was in a national theater, we always got a script. And the script is kind of perfect. You know, you know exactly what you're going to say. You know, when is the premiere? You more or less know what will be the process of getting there. And, and so you come to a day of premiere and you are usually very good in what you are doing. And then people clap you and you're becoming better and better repeating those same words. So of course, there are many variations and it's still alive, but it's still the same. And in life, it seems like there is no script before. It's like you've been thrown on the stage. We don't know what's going on. People shout on us. People, maybe some people like us, some people hate us. Many people, they do not care what we are doing, right? You go home, you try to reorganize, you rewrite the script. You rewrite the script of being uh, according to what happened before. So you rewrote that beautiful script. You come back and suddenly you realize, okay, I thought I'm with five people there, but actually there is only me. So instead of being a dialogue, it is a monologue. And again, you screw it up and you go back home and you rewrite it again. And then you go back in on the stage. And, and so there's this process of constant rewriting the mm-hmm. scripts that you are meeting every day. And so you become like, you're becoming a more diverse actor somehow in your life. And you can take more roles and you can take more time. And you can, and what is so beautiful about it, that you can take time while people are watching you, observing you, commenting on you. You know, when, when no one is watching, everything is possible. But there is this beautiful aspect when someone starts to look at you. These people are like a lions. They can take something away from you. Right when we have now discussion together, and there there's potentially many people hearing it, uh, you know, this they're like alliance. They will eat you up. Or, or you also can say, uh, I I do just what I do, no matter what other people are thinking about what I do or what they think about what I just said, because that's just also a temporary discussion that will disappear, and a new discussion will uh, come later on. So it gives you that kind of adaptability of not being attached so, so much to your knowledge, not being attached to that particular role that you've been developing, rather than always playing the same role and becoming the biggest star in that particular play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that idea of the, the scripts that we have is, is a really interesting one because on some level, uh, life is, a, is an improv, right? It's, it's just... Uh, yeah. It's uh, there's no there's no lines fed you, but on the other hand there are right because there are scripts that we yes. have they're social scripts. So you're a married man, yes. you're a father. I'm a married man, I'm a father. Yes. We we are we are each individually improv- improvisationally performing the role of father, but we're also mm-hmm. each embodying in some sense the archetype of father, the archetype of husband that we've seen portrayed that we that has been passed down for thousands of years there's a there's some every every husband is a husband in, in their own way or wife is a wife in their own way every father is a father in their own way yes. there's also some things that are universal to every father that that is that is successful at being a father mm-hmm. and so this is again this it, it strikes me as again it's this this fun balance between the the, the thing that it's um. It actually reminds me a, a little bit of the idea of of, of being and becoming, right? Uh, you know, the, this ancient debate in philosophy, right? There's the the forms, right? Fatherhood is a form. Um, but then there's the individual father, right? So uh, Plato talked about the forms, and uh, who was it? I can't remember this. Uh, perhaps you'll remember. Was it Antisthenes who said, uh, "One man never stops." Uh, I don't know. Steps in the same river twice, right? Oh, Heraclitus. Heraclitus. Yeah. One man never steps in the same river twice. So we're both. We, we, yeah, so, yeah, tell. Um, and and uh, so, so we're to do what we need, what we need to do, you know, or to, 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 to be the, the best father, to be the best mover, to be the best whatever, to be the most complete expression of it for ourselves we're always balancing between um between expressing the archetype and bringing what is novel and unique about ourselves into it you know um we have a four sentences about this we said what we have learned what we learn what we have to unlearn in order to learn it mm-hmm. what we have learned is our long evolution what we learn is our prenatal and early childhood development. What we have to unlearn through what was given to us through five social forces in order to learn it, to kind of come back to 
really who we are. And it comes to the, such a simple thing as, yes, I'm an, I am a father. But how often do I really see that the face of my child is changing, you know? Mm -hmm. That, you know, like you assume that you know your child, but in fact, you have no idea. They are like really great, amazing human beings that are evolving so, so greatly every day. And I just have the feeling that it requires from me a lot, a, a lot of spontaneous attention and a lot of love of engagement that allows me to see their face as a new. I truly enjoy by hugging them, being with them. I, I, I don't feel I need to spend time with them. I'm not obliged to spend time with them. I want to spend time with them. And because I, there is this strong need of seeing them, seeing them as a new, uh, so I don't fall into that automatic pilot. As, as soon as I can see some another feature that I didn't see before, I'm becoming younger. I am... I'm donating, I'm storing so much dopamine into my older age because I get excited from nothing. I get excited by things that are invisible for the external universe, right? When, when we practice in, in fighting monkey zero forms for better longevity or whatever, it is the quality of seeing things that are invisible, things that you cannot share with anyone. And if you can be happy with the fact that you found a better quality of emotion or your, your heart has settled or lower its heart rate or you find more pleasure by being yourself, this is very difficult to share on social media. This is almost very difficult to share with the most intimate person you know. It's only for you. But if you can be happy about those invisible things, you will be happy all your life. You do not have to need the happiness from big, exciting things that everyone else can see. And I find that so, so valuable. And I wish, I wish for everyone. And, and, and this is what we try to kind of transmit in every single workshop and, and communication we have. How you can be happy like a six-year-old child in front of a Christmas tree when you suddenly realize that the quality of your skin has changed. That yes, you are aging, but in some way you 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 understood what that aging brought you and what you also lost and will never be returned, right? So that acceptance of aging, but also kind of slowing down that entropy through through enjoyment of seeing the transformation, let's say. Trying to arrange this structural and kinetic hygiene to find your biological signature, right? We, we said that zero forms in fighting monkey research is structural and kinetic hygiene. What does it mean? It means that we need to understand what is the structure. We need to understand that little more objective, what was given to us from early heaven, what was given to us from our DNA, right? But we need to study, we need to study what was given in motion. So in transformation, that's that structure of kinetic hygiene to find your biological signature. Biological signature is extremely important for your development and your aging because you need to understand why the pill sometimes works and sometimes does not. Meaning that I need to understand, and that's the biggest task that we have. I give you a herb to make you more healthy because there is some certain disbalance in your in your belly. So I give you some bitter thing and you become better. And I give the same herb to someone else that has also a stomach problem, but it doesn't work on him or her. And that's the biological signature mean to understand how we differ from each other. Right? And this is like and this kind of knowledge is a knowledge of an egg. What we what we create mainly in our Western thinking is that did you hear me? No, it sounded like you said knowledge of an egg. Yes, okay. exactly. I want a, I want knowledge of an egg. I don't want a knowledge of a box. Now I explain you something about an egg. Egg doesn't have a. It has a. The the egg, if it's approached through linear thinking, will break. So if you take an egg and you take a pencil, it will break. It will. The life will not be there. But if you embrace that egg. From all the direction, the egg is very powerful. The life is very powerful when you embrace it as a whole, right? Now, also, what kind of structure of that egg shell you will create? If it's too thick, it will protect the life, but the new life will not be able to find its way out. A small crocodile coming out or small, small chicken or small bird trying to get out will not be able to get out. But if it's too weak, it will break before the life was created. 
Egg is also something that requires a constant attention, not uh, um, uh, not attention that would be, be drawing too much energy from you or being obsessive, but that attention, like when you put an egg on the on the table, you need to put a one finger on it so it doesn't roll off the table and break. And that little attention in your daily life, it's so extremely important. But we do not have energy for that little amount of attention. That's why when when we walk, when we sit, our spine is always collapsing because our spine requires a little bit of attention, constantly, attunement. But that finer quality of paying attention to small to invisible has left us because we became so rude. And that's also related to our pattern of knowing because we know we are being crushed we are being too heavy by what we carry all the time that was a beautiful analogy that's like a a parable about movement um knowledge of an egg i I wanted to go back um because i feel like we're circling around this this idea that that that's popped in my head of uh this is something that again well, it's actually something I, I learned from my friend Todd Hargrove, but also I was talking about this with um, with with Vivek, which is the idea of like complicated problems and complex problems, and how do we negotiate them? And uh, we could also talk about well-defined and ill-defined problems. So, um, if, if you dislocate your elbow, uh, that is actually uh, it's a it's a complicated problem because it's difficult to get it back together, but it's 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 there's a set of steps that put the elbow back together right a surgeon can do it and they can know exactly what to do and they can be a hundred percent correct putting that elbow back in place every single time that's thanks god i mean yes (laughs) now especially after car accident yeah now the process from which you take that injured elbow that is now in place but no longer structurally sound and you make it into a robust strong capable elbow again that's a complex problem there's no fixed protocol that gets you from one point to the end and it's not a simple mechanical problem it's a problem that involves the emotional system the integration of the muscles right and that involves the the emo, uh, you know the social environment right if you go and you are with the people that you train with you'll heal faster because you'll feel their support right it, yes you I, you know I, I can see that your joint is out of place but i can't look at you and tell how how much collagen has been laid down i can't tell mm. you know, how well it's been laid down i can't tell how intelligent that system is and so all the things that you know so much of what you and i deal with is 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 compl- complex problems and and when we think about things from a, a mechanical standpoint we're trying to treat complex problems as complicated problems mhm Mm-hmm. Very beautiful. And there's and, not much that can be added to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. And and yes. so what I hear in you so often is this 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 like let's respect the complexity and let's be investigators. Let's be playful in how we start trying to engage with these things. Yeah, you know, I would like to share with you something. I, it's, um, the, you know, there are some periods where we really need to write a lot, and I sit more than often, even if we are mainly practitioners. And, and sit more means still for us being able to train for two, three hours a day, right? But there are these moments where four or five hours you just sit in, and then and then I have this burst of need to move my body because I just cannot sit anymore. And I, over the years, I realized something incredible. So I go and I try to put my body in action and I'm also so tired and I'm also so sad about or, 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 or burdened by what I was working on. So, so I just senselessly put, senselessly put my body in action. So you, I don't know, you leave the kettlebell on you or you run or you, or you lift weights or you, you just do something and you feel good about yourself when you finish, you're all sweating. Now, I'm, I'm always thinking, wow, when you are tired, when you're in an energetical crisis, it's very difficult to be creative. It's very difficult to explore. Because, you know, like, imagine that you've been sitting every day in an office for eight, ten hours. Then I, someone would come to Fighting Monkey and, I, and they would just start to articulate the joints. They would go, no, I need to get it out of myself, you know. 
So these people have really great challenge at the beginning, you know, to to establish a new relation. It's 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 you know that's why I I, I don't like to. And no, this is not what you've done or anything. It just came to my mind. This is I don't like to comment on people if they train well or not train well, you know, or or they they just abuse themselves or not. You know, sometimes you you do not understand how you got into that cycle, and you need like what you mentioned just before. You need a good surrounding that someone help that can help you to kind of awaken. Someone who slaps your face, someone who who supports you in the transformation. Because alone, it's it's very difficult. You cannot make it alone. You know, we try to, we like these wolves and eagles and they use these animals, but they're highly social they're creatures, you know, like uh, being alone, it's, it's brutal. You know, like if, if anyone is a, my, my, uh, my authority, if anyone is my great inspiration is the hyena society. Mm-hmm. I just love these guys there. You know, I just love this, this society where the lowest ranking female is still higher ranking than the highest ranking man, you know, and they are so successful in hunting. They're so successful in communication and, and how they organize themselves in hunting is just incredible. So, and that kind of collaborative work, that kind of decentralized knowledge, this exchange of the information, the fact that we are talking together, that's the most valuable thing from all, you know. But what is my aim in my life? It's not even to long live. I don't care about it. But I care about these basic relations that I'm building up every day. If I can have a good meal with someone, and if I can go for a beautiful walk into the park, I, can, I do not have to do more. You know, we don't have to always search for more, no, search for longevity, searching for fitness, searching for cleverness. No, we can, within our very simple life, we can have a quite rich, rich engagement with another human beings. Because I have seen many people that are rather simple. They do not know anything about what we are talking here. And for them, it would be like an alien language. Still, these people are extremely rich in the way they articulate themselves the way they engage themselves with the materials or with uh, with the, with their families and i'm just so inspired that 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 not only those that they read and know know many of those that are just the villagers doing doing just that one thing over and over again carry such an incredible knowledge and and it, and it's so inspiring and and and, and so uh, so revitalizing for me right so I, I I I I believe you know like we we need to talk more to more people that have nothing to do with what we are doing you know this shitty movement idea and all these all these things that we are we are enjoyingly articulating together because many people they just do it and they even many times do not know they are they are doing it and and so for this is for us and the greatest challenge you know so we kind of engage in a more simple communication pathways and channels um yeah yeah so <laughs> there's there's it's almost existentialist right um it's it's this is this call to 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 focus on the experience of existence right and and to, yeah. to make that rich and not to focus so much on 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 achievement or knowing or, or anything else because it's in it's in the what what Reiki might call that perspectival and participatory. That's where the richness is. That's where the meaning is. And um, yeah. this is a uh, there's a there's a, a theme that I've been wanting to 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 bring in here, which is which is escaping me for the moment. <laughs> um, I've drawn a blank, but uh, but yeah, there's a there's a richness in 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 how we can engage. Ah, this is this is it. It took me a second here. Um, you were talking about seeing the change in your child's face from a day to day, right? Yeah. And and being able to to pay attention to that and to to fall in love with that process. And yeah. there's this idea that that I got from Verveki, which I really like, which is this idea that that love is a process of reciprocal realization, right? At, at the moment, as you and I are speaking. Um, I am becoming more real to you and you're becoming more real to me through our communication. We are, we are getting to know each other better. We are tuning through our nervous systems and that when we, when we can engage in a practice that allows this evolutionary growth within us, it doesn't have to be articulate, mm-hmm. have to be, you know, sophisticated movement, but for a farmer who can sit down every day and find something new, some little thing that he can refine and do better in the way that he, um, 
you know, he treats his his pigs right, and, uh, and he finds a better path to bring uh, to get his pigs to the best acorns in the forest, right? And he he's done this for for sixty years. He's been walking these paths, and he knows it in a way, and he knows these subtleties, and he knows these subtleties of the land. He's he has that same relationship that's being called out, that ability to to recognize something real and to realize it, and to gain meaning from it. Um, and I think that this is at the center of, of what I hear you articulating and what makes me want to come back and continue to engage with, with you, Yosef, and with Fighting Monkey is this, this idea that, that we can connect, that we can afford ourselves connection, and we can afford ourselves this realization process through our practices. Yeah. You know, the, the, the whole landscape that we are articulating in our research is, I told you in a last meeting, was around the six pillars. And one is the zero forms where we're looking for this uh, biological signature and how the signature changes as, as we age and so how we can slow down this entropy a little bit more. And then is the striking forms. Striking forms is anthropological research and what was given to us in understanding of distance, understanding of our precision to throw something. And that led us to development of many different sports and a lot of gestural expression then then we have a body body forms where you where you kind of articulate two bodies next to each other that gave birth to all the healing practices uh, manipulative practices uh, massages uh, uh, osteopathy etc until the evolution of judo jiu-jitsu wrestling uh, greco-roman wrestling mongolian wrestling etc then there's another pillar that that we are searching uh, quite a lot and upon upon this three main pillars that are teaching us something more objective about physical world comes something that we call tribal dancing something where we find our own color in whatever we do so it means when we work with this olympic champion in judo he said this is my judo this is not just judo this is my judo this is my particular color this is the way i speak this is way this is the this is a color of my voice this is how many roles i take in on myself and disguise myself and appear as someone else so to so to kind of challenge the opponent and then there is a sculpting. So we need to sculpt the material. We need to use our hands. We need to understand how what the physical world is made of and how, how for our interaction, we can alter those materials. And the last one that ah, kind of covers all of them is our quality of communication. So we are able to tell the stories that inspire other people to get on the journey and allow a certain transformation. Because what's the most difficult part in our life? We know that something must be changed, but we have little energy to do so. I, I will tell you a little story. So, you, you know, my, my father passed through some difficult times in a health, but it doesn't matter. We don't have to discuss that. But he was watching a TV with me in Slovakia, and he was watching the National Geographic about dying bees. You know, bees are dying and, and he was sitting, sitting and suddenly I see his forehead go a little bit like this and he said, bees are dying? You know, he's a villager, he's a hunter, he doesn't know anything about the big world. So suddenly he stood up and he disappeared for three, three hours. He took the car and he just went somewhere. Then I was in home, I was waiting with a mom, doing other things and suddenly he came back with a smile on his face with the three books underneath his arm. And two days later, he was already building uh, beehives and... And one month later, we had a bee colony, and now we have, have we are having our own honey. And and what I try to say here is that you know we always complain this and that must be done, and uh, this is so going so wrong. But we are hardly ever really stand up and go to do something about it. And this is because we are first of all so selfish, and because also because we are just loving our habits so much. We are so comfortable within what we do, and we do not have any extra energy to engage in a new exploration. That's just a brutal reality of our everyday life. It's complicated to have an energetical surplus or build it, that energetical surplus that you can become again vulnerable and explore something more than what there is, and so that you can age and grow in a kind of wiseness in understanding that the world can be bigger rather than always smaller. Like when you look at your feeds in these social medias and YouTube, where you actually eventually start to see only what you've been searching for and there's nothing else being filtrated in. So you have to abandon it. You just have to, you know, like we always read the book someone else recommended for us. Just go somewhere and just pick up a random book and not with the best cover. Just go blind, just pick up one and pick up the one that no one been reading before. And if someone tells you, please read that one, never read it. 
<laughs> or if they really insist, they yes, buy it, but they put it somewhere that you don't see it for a following 10 years. And only after when the trend falls off, then you open the book and then you read it. This is one of the one of the things that I do always. And you know, we've, we've been quite successfully successfully working in in at a certain moment in our lives with Linda in Belgium. And we said, are we going to stay there? And he said, no, we do not want to be melted into one soup with everyone else with their great ideas. We rather go to periphery because in periphery, when something is twisting, turning, you have much more momentum. And so you are much more on the edge. You have to struggle a little bit more. Not everything is available to you. And I love that capacity of not having everything available. Now you Google whatever you want and you have it available there. I don't offer you to you anything for free. If you want something, you have to search for it. I can give you a keyword. That's the most that I give you. Then you have to take your backpack and go in the mountains and search for it. I was exp- I was explaining this example. You know, now now if you want to learn, let's say, Chinese medicine, or you want to learn medicine in general, and I give that example quite often in our workshops. Now you come to a university, and what do you do? You learn from photocopy. You get the books, and someone is telling you something, but that's just a photocopy. You do not understand how this process, how this, how this medicine, how this, how this thing has evolved. What I want from you is that you take a backpack and you go to Himalaya, searching for that great master that they told you about. You come there, you probably do not find that person, but you understand within which environment that medicine was built. Because it's a big mountains, it's a little bit colder, because not everything is available. And once you learn from that master, someone tells you about some other master, but that other master lives in Mongolia. And then you see that the medicine in Mongolia is a little bit different because the herbs from Himalaya are not in Mongolia. And uh, there is much more dust and uh, the space is more open and there are higher winds, uh, stronger winds. So every landscape gives you a different idea why a certain type of medicine was built. But we do not, we do not have that context. We only have the final result. We have only that name and the form. And so it is really important to really stop to read the photocopies. What is the guy who created the press? Uh, 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 Gutenberg, mm-hmm. Guten, uh, yeah. yeah, Gutenberg, Gutenberg Press. Thank, thank, thank you very much. You know, I, I feel like a lot of great stuff was done there, but also I think a lot of things went away. And I think because now everything is at the at the tip of your fingertip, I think you should not be reaching for it anytime you wish. Sometimes it is necessary to take time for things. Yeah. And this taking time is becoming more and more complicated for everyone. We want everything and we want it now. There's like no way we're going to wait. Everyone is hurrying everywhere. So when you come to our practice, I'm not going to give it to you now. This is you don't understand first workshop, you leave. Very good. Goodbye. And I'm so happy about it. So we don't we have less people. So I can spend more energy with people that are it that want to engage in uncertainty. You know, Heisenberg uncertainty, quantum physics uncertainty. When you are not really sure how the what will be the end of the result. And so when you're coming first workshop, second, third, fourth, and the puzzle starts to come a little bit together. If you didn't fall somewhere at the beginning, at the end, you can, might come up with your own ideas how to, how, to, how to construct your idea about the world and how you want to practice. And that's just the most wonderful thing you can do to allow the people that you're working with to become greater than you are. But if you don't want that other people are greater than we are, because that just makes us feel shit. But how beautiful is that, you know, we said once with Linda, we should be training our people as our kids because we don't want our kids to be smaller than us. I want my kids to be independent and I want my kids to go into the world and I want to eventually do what they want to do. But if you do that, they just come to you and they just visit you and share stories with you. While if you're dominating other people, they need you badly for all their life. They're completely dependent on you. And that's like a Lord of the Rings. You hold the ring. It's very addictive. It's very... I mean, you're craving like crazy because having a power in your hands is so addictive and you need to resist that kind of thing every day. And that's, that is looping us back to um, this automated pilot that, you know, like you, you know, you have kids, you know, you have family, you know that you're doing something right. But question a little bit if you could find better solutions from good. Maybe I'm doing all this research, but maybe I'm still better in something else. So maybe I can sit one day and think, well, is this what I'm doing still that thing that I really wanted? Can, how often can I come, how often can I become in my life nobody again? Linda said that a few times, she said, I had several opportunities in my life to become nobody. That's what pushed me forward. And I love that idea so much. 
Yeah. I was teaching uh, two, I was teaching two national teams of judo, um, some m- mental training and rehabilitation and preparation for competition and 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 the main guy that was there and he saw me in a kimono with white belt. You know, I have to respect them, so I I put my gi, I put the white belt because I'm not a judoka. Mm-hmm. And he came to me and he says, "You are just one nobody," because yes, I was nobody, but it was a very beautiful position to be in. Because you're a little bit vulnerable, you are stepping into the world of someone else, and there was this there was this French coach, uh, national coach of of of, of, of French judo Olympic team that collected so many gold medals, and he picked me up and he says, "You are not a judoka, right?" And I said, "No, but I see your footwork is very good because you're listening so well." So that nobody allows me to listen better, that nobody allows me to explore again. If I have another possibilities in my in my life and i think i've said everything today yeah, now i have to go and drink some glass of red wine or something <laughs> um yeah um i, I talk I, the last two conversations i feel like i, I, I had a, the same theme which is this um the the necessity of restarting from the beginning because that's where we grow the fastest right but to do that, you have to let go of your ego. <laughs> I'm wearing my white belt when I go to judo class right now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, I think that this is probably uh, a nice a nice point to to wrap our conversation yes. today. It was really yes. wonderful, and uh, and we'll definitely have to do it again. This is a, a conversation I feel has a lot of richness. So, uh, thank you once again, Yosef, for sharing your stories. Thank you very much. Perspective. Thank you very much. And uh, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes, I will be very happy. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Enjoy your red wine. <laughs> Thank you. I will. I will. Thanks for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast. If you want to support what we're doing, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notifications button so you know what's coming up. And of course, the biggest support you can give is to become a Patreon supporter. This is what's going to allow us to grow this platform more than anything else. So this is entirely listener supported, and we really appreciate your support. And we look forward to talking to you again soon.